Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sanket Pisat and welcome to the seventh question of our endogyne training quiz where we discuss matters related to everyday confusions and decision making concepts in gyne endoscopy. So before we start our standard disclaimer that medicine is not an exact science and these are my personal opinions they may be different from published evidence or conventional teaching but if you have a difference in opinion we'd love to hear it in the comment section below the video so please leave your comments and if you have a difficult or interesting case we'd love to discuss it so please send us the case on endogyne training at gmail.com and we would love to include it for those of you who have not yet joined please visit endogyne training.com and you'll find a link to join the group over there and you can also take part in the discussion so coming to the case at hand this is the hsg film that i had shared and we had asked whether you think that this is a normal uterus or a t-shaped uterus so i think I agree with the majority opinion and 96% people have said that they think it is a T-shaped uterus which I agree with because uh, even the obvious shape of the uterus is like a T and you can see that it is a very narrow uterus with the walls being extremely convergent so the normal uterus would have been assuming that this is the level of the internal loss over here maybe somewhere at the level of the internal loss. Uh, even then the normal uterus would have been of this particular shape and so this is definitely a t-shaped uterus there is no doubt about that the question is how can we objectively assess a t-shaped uterus whether it is there or not but at least on the primary side this does appear to be a t-shaped uterus so i will agree with the majority opinion that yes uh, this does look like a t-shaped uterus so moving on to the next question does she need surgery and here again I would agree with the majority opinion and almost 87% people have said that yes she does require surgery. So I think this coincides with the previous uh, answer that we had that if you do consider that this is definitely a t-shaped uterus then this patient will definitely benefit by surgery. So the purpose of actually asking this question is uh, to conclude that if there is a patient who has a diagnosed t-shaped uterus then surgery will definitely benefit this patient. There is a school of thought that says that T-shaped uterus surgery or hysteroscopic lateral metroplasty is one of the most abused surgeries in gynae endoscopy which is true in case you do not have a proper uh, case selection and you have not selected your cases well but if you had a proper case selection then T-shaped uterus surgery responds very well to uh, gives very good results in terms of reproductive outcome so that was the purpose of asking this surgery if she does have a t-shaped uterus then yes she will be benefited by surgery then moving on to the next slide and the third question that we had asked is which ailment caused by this condition responds better to surgery so here we have got some mixed responses the majority of people have said that she will so 12 percent people have said that infertility is the symptom that will be benefited uh, 30 percent people have said that recurrent pregnancy loss is what will be benefited and almost 55 percent people have said that both will be benefited so i think i agree with the majority opinion here as well in a case where there is a t-shaped uterus there are now studies to conclusively prove that it is not only infertility but also recurrent pregnancy loss both have shown a very good effect of lateral metroplasty again i emphasize the point that the lateral metroplasty has to be done in a correctly selected case and the technique of lateral metroplasty has to be proper so if both of these criteria are satisfied we will see good results in both infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss and there have also been reports where the live birth rate has also been shown to be significantly better of course in correctly selected cases of lateral metroplasty so that then brings us to the next question uh, rather the fourth question would you like to give estrogen supplementation after surgery now here again 88 percent people have replied in the affirmative that they would like to give supplementation so yes again i agree with this because of the fact that we are going to have a large num we are going to be cutting a large portion of the uterine wall 
uh, almost from here to here and so there is going to be a significant amount of denudation which is going to happen because this denudation has happened we would like to give estrogen supplementation to ensure that the endometrium grows over the part that we have cut and the patient does not have post operative synecy now we are going to have another session on this because it will be too much to discuss in one video about how exactly we prevent post operative synecy formation in cases of operative hysteroscopy and which are the patients in whom this kind of uh, estrogen supplementation is indicated so that will be discussed in another session but as of now yes i think i agree with the fact that i would like to give estrogen supplementation to this patient after this particular surgery so then let us uh, move on to the next question and which of these methods is a which of these is a reliable method to decide whether she requires surgical correction or not so most people have again replied that it is a mri which will require the surgical correction i'm sorry for that so sorry for that bit of confusion uh we had we came to come to the fifth question and it was asked which of these is a more reliable method to decide whether she requires surgical correction and i think most of the people 50% of people have chosen 3d ultrasound which is the correct answer so a 3d ultrasound is the one correct way of finding out whether or not she actually requires surgery but the other options also are worth discussing and it is important to know so hsg is a definitive uh, marker yes but hsg will not be able to tell us if there is a subtle difference and whether this cavity is if it is a obviously t shaped cavity like this one then of course there is nothing to think about you can definitely decide on an hsg alone but if the cavity is not so narrow maybe just this much in size or maybe it is just this much in size then we are not sure whether or not a t shaped i mean a lateral metroplasty is required and therefore it will be difficult to decide an mri also yes possible but mostly uh, radiologists who are well versed with mri are not very well versed with congenital uterine anomalies if it is someone who is doing uh, uterine anomalies and their assessment regularly on mri then their findings may be good but a 3d ultrasound will be one of the most reliable markers to decide whether or not preoperatively she requires surgical correction now this particular point is also very important and i have was given in one point decide intraoperatively if the cavity looks small now if you do have a patient who has not been diagnosed as a t shaped uterus preoperatively and you find that there is a obviously tubular cavity inside with very deep seated ostea on the uh, hysteroscopy diagnostic then you may take a chance and do a lateral metroplasty for this particular patient but this is if the if the cavity obviously looks very small what we have to try and avoid is an impulsive decision of trying to do lateral metroplasty in every single case where the cavity looks a little bit of a variant from a normal regular good sized cavity so small defects or small visual perceptions which uh, tell us that the cavity may be slightly small these impulses have to be avoided on the ot table and doing unnecessary lateral metroplasty on a patient who does not have a genuine t shaped uterus can be very uh, difficult and it can make the patient's reproductive life more difficult by inducing synecy which are then even more difficult to correct so uh, decide intraoperatively if the cavity looks very small yes but this is in only in the case of very very obvious findings on hysteroscopy for marginal findings i would not do this and i still think that 3d ultrasound will be the good way to go in case such a thing comes up now coming to the next question which adhesion barrier i missed this question earlier which adhesion barrier would you like to use after surgery is the question that we had asked and uh, so let's start with each answer one by one uh, some people 12% people have said foley's catheter number 
सो एज सच फोलिस कैथेटर नंबर ट्वेल्व इज अ वेरी लार्ज कैथेटर टू गो इन साइड द यूट्राइन कैविटी फोलिस कैथेटर नंबर ट्वेल्व विल ओनली फिट इन साइड द यूट्राइन कैविटी वेर देर इज एन एनोमिलस एनलार्जमेंट मे बी ऑफ वन ऑफ द हॉर्नस ऑफ द यूट्रिस मे बी लाइक अ रॉबर्ट्स यूट्रिस वेर यू हैव डन अ यूनिफिकेशन सर्जरी एंड द नॉर्मल साइज एट और टेन नंबर फोलिस कैथेटर विल नॉट फिट इन साइड बट फॉर मोस्ट पेशेंट्स पुटिंग इन अ ट्वेल्व नंबर फोलिस कैथेटर विल बी डिफिकल्ट और इम्पॉसिबल देन uh we come to foley's catheter number 8 and iucd so let's take iucd first like i said we are going to have another discussion on which is the ideal adhesion barrier after hysteroscopic surgery but that's a big topic so we'll discuss it separately uh but essentially the iucd as you all know is available either as a copper t or as an lng iud or as a multi load device that has this particular shape and this does not really replicate the shape of the uterine cavity so it still leaves a lot of raw areas behind that can stick back after the surgery so i would not put this as a first priority of an adhesion prevention barrier then that leaves us with two more options one it's not required and second is foley's catheter i'm sorry second is foley's catheter number 8 these are the two options that are left behind uh technically i would prefer to put in a adhesion barrier or a separating barrier between the two raw surfaces after every major hysteroscopic surgery because if you have done an extensive septal incision or a lateral metroplasty you now have two raw areas that are opposing each other so if you've done a septal resection then these are the two walls and you have got an area over here and an area over here and both of these are now raw surfaces assuming that the uterus gets deflated after the surgery there is a very good chance that adhesion bands will form between two adjacent raw areas uh, because that is the natural healing tendency of the body so i would prefer to put in a barrier of foley's catheter number 8 or it can be number 10 as well after the surgery this is a small pediatric foley's catheter and the bulb has to be inflated about 3 ml in order to Uh, obliterate or in order to occupy the uterine cavity completely but we we'll look at this in another separate video now coming to the last one uh the last one is uh, i'm sorry right so the last option that we had given is it's not required so again i think we discussed this uh, some people and some ivf specialists are of the opinion that by putting in a pediatric foley's catheter inside one may either induce infection or one may induce pressure necrosis of the uh, endometrium however uh, this usually does not happen of course opinions are divided and i work with a lot of ivf specialists and even among ivf specialists in the city of mumbai there is a divided opinion as to whether these can be caused or not so some people do prefer to put in a pediatric foley's catheter some people do not but uh, as far as my personal opinion goes i would definitely put in a separating membrane to prevent the two raw surfaces from sticking back to each other so now we come to the last slide and the last point of discussion in this particular case how exactly does one decide whether or not a particular patient requires a lateral metroplasty so this at present date is given by a specific international criteria which is called as the cum criteria the cume cum criteria stands for the congenital uterine malformations by experts the cum criteria is an objective and well accepted criteria now so that one will be able to definitely decide whether or not a given patient requires lateral metroplasty these measurements have all to be taken in the coronal section of a 3d ultrasound and the experts have defined three separate criteria so these three criteria are one the lateral angle which is the angle formed at this level between the isthmus and the uterine body the second is the lateral depth and the lateral depth is decided by a line joining the uh, internal os to the cornu 
and one draws this line and measures the maximum depth of the inward indentation inside from this line up till the point of maximum inward indentation. The third criteria is the T angle and this is the angle this is also called as the cornual angle and this is the angle which is measured at the cornu. The three criteria that have been defined are a lateral angle of less than 130 degrees so this angle 130 degrees or less this distance 7 millimeters or less and this angle 40 degrees or less and these are the three criteria that have been defined using these three criteria how does one define a t-shaped uterus so they have said that a uterus is normal or arcuate if so let us ignore the arcuate let us say that it is a normal uterus if either none of the criteria are satisfied or only one out of the three criteria is satisfied then this uterus can be said to be a normal uterus then if only two out of three criteria are satisfied if only two out of three criteria are satisfied then this is said to be a borderline t-shaped uterus and only if all three criteria are satisfied this is supposed to be a t-shaped uterus and hence if only one criterion if none no none of the criteria only one criteria or two out of three criteria are satisfied this is the patient who does not require surgery only if all three criteria are satisfied is the patient classified as a t-shaped uterus and this is the patient who will benefit maximally by lateral metroplasty surgery in the next video, we'll probably discuss how exactly lateral metroplasty is done. But till then, happy viewing. And for those of you who have not yet joined the group, I welcome you to join the group on endogynetraining at gmail.com and take part with us in our discussion. So thank you so much. That's all for now. And we'll meet next time with the video on lateral metroplasty surgery.